Hey everyone, welcome back to Secret Sonics. This is episode 139 with Brian Bender. I had a great chat with Brian and we talked about so many things, including his early days getting started in New York City, working for the likes of Philip Glass and Russ Elevato. We talked about how the business is all about relationships. We talked about moving out to LA, his mindset when recording bass, um, the importance of timing in performance, programming, and in compression. We talked about working with Nate Smith and Dave Holland, getting the very best hand claps, uh, creative versus corrective mixing, building his own customized desk, psychoacoustics, and why it's so important, and in the end, being yourself and leaning into your own creative voice. So tons of great takeaways here. I really enjoyed this conversation. I think you will too. So here's my conversation with Brian Bender coming up right here on Secret Sonics. Hey, everyone. If you're anything like me, you often find yourself looking for business insight in podcasts. And I'm sure many of you are also into meditation and reflection to help better understand yourself. Former guest of the show, Carl Bonner, decided to launch a podcast that brings these two elements together. It's a series of guided self-reflection exercises, but specifically for freelance creatives like you and me, focusing on the struggles we face as we try to grow our businesses, while also finding more happiness in the work that we do. It's called Thanks for Thinking, It's definitely an unusual format, but if you want to grow your self-awareness, find deeper career satisfaction, and make more money, then I think this podcast might be for you. Experience it for yourself and click the link in the show notes below. You're listening to Secret Sonics, a podcast exploring the creative side of music production. Join us weekly for honest conversations with real-world music producers and audio professionals. Hello, and welcome back to Secret Sonics. I am your host, Ben Wallach. My guest today is Brian Bender. Brian is a producer, mixer, composer, and sound designer with over 15 years of experience across almost every segment of music and audio production. I heard Brian on Kirk Hamilton's excellent podcast, Strong Songs, recently, or not even that recently, (laughs) and I reached out to see if he'd be interested to come on the podcast. took a little bit, but eventually worked out, and he's graciously agreed to join us on the air. So with all that to say, uh, welcome to Secret Sonics, Brian. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. So tell the audience a tiny bit about your story, or however much you feel like sharing. You know, I know you worked in New York City for a while in some big studios and with Philip Glass. I'd love to hear a little bit about your background and kind of how you transitioned into, I guess, even from music as a, at the beginning, transitioning into audio sure. and then kind of almost to today, if you will. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I have a pretty like long and circuitous tale. So saddle up, kids. I started uh, <laughs> playing music initially. I started playing bass when I was 12 and got really uh, just totally obsessed with jazz and hip hop and like the black American diaspora of music and studied the shit out of jazz and went to Indiana. I'm from Bloomington, Indiana originally. So I was lucky enough to spend a lot of time with the wonderful pedagogue David Baker who famously was like with George Russell in the 60s when George was developing the Lydian chromatic concept and was a trombone player and like, you know, had firsthand stories with Monk and and Bud Powell and people like that. Anyway, like I got to see his big band play in my elementary school when I was in third grade and I was like, that, that's it. That's what I want to do. And uh, so started playing immediately, went to undergrad initially for performance for double bass. That's my instrument. My first instrument is bass. Yeah, same here, by the way. I mean, not, not double bass, but bass. Yeah, right. Yeah. Bass players, I think, always make great producers, too. I agree. <laughs> you know, you, <laughs> and we can get back to that later. But it, like, you know, the, totally. the thesis is that you're sort of at the center of a Venn diagram of harmony, rhythm and melody, you know? Yes. The mother yeah. and the father, as Ornette Coleman said to me one time. Uh <laughs> <laughs> so I, oh no, the ground in the sky. Sorry, the mother and the father were somebody else. So I started playing. I went to college. I started like, you know, playing six, eight hours, practicing a day really obsessively and had bad techniques. So I ended up giving myself ganglion cysts in both of my hands, uh, which are little tears in your cartilage where your body starts like leaking this fluid and, and your body then to prevent it from like going into your bloodstream makes these little calcium deposits around it. And they're totally benign. They're not really that invasive uh, unless, like me, you just keep working through it and don't take care of yourself, in which case, like, you kind of get to the point where you need, like, a surgical outcome or you kind of have to stop. And so the one that I had was underneath uh, my right hand, like, really in some, like, soft zone that I was very scared to get surgery on. So I pretty much just kind of had to lay off serious performance. 
and I started doing acupuncture and qigong and like found my way back and like healed my shit up uh, okay but and I can play you know all sorts of other stuff now but like concert bass capital B was done for me I had already like been producing and stuff so I transitioned very naturally into the audio department at Indiana University which is one of the best in the in the country as far as I'm aware you got really lucky finishing up there the the professors kind of clocked me as a lifer so they put me in touch with a, an IU alum called Mark Plotty who's a legendary New York producer and engineer and bass player he produced famously like Heroes for David Bowie and was Bowie's MD in the 90s and mm, he has wow. like stories about Prince and like the first time I visited his studio in the East Village I went into the bathroom and he had like a Fat Boys gold record on the wall and I got super starstruck because like you know I'm old enough that Disorderlies was huge for me when I was a kid anyway me and this dude had l breakfast at Cafe Mogador in the East Village and didn't talk about audio at all he just totally felt me out and at the end he was like alright cool you seem cool I'll get you a job interning with Philip the ellipsis points <laughs> at the end of that statement were glass and i like of course was shitting my pants and moved to new york very quickly <laughs> thereafter um wow so my first job in the city was there and i was like i'm staying with a friend of a friend whom i had never met in hartsdale of all places and like taking the metro north down with all the venture capitalists that were like ruining our country <laughs> <laughs> to go work for free for these music weirdos it was great um so i ultimately found a place in bushwick and like moved to the city proper and and got a job uh, assisting there and Mark had put my name in over at the Hit Factory as well. And so I got a call from them about eight months into the city and worked at the Hit Factory for a second. I have the funny story of being the last person the Hit Factory men hadn't ever hired. Really? Uh, yeah, I worked there for two weeks. And then, like, whatever the fucking guy's name that closed the place down, Bob or whatever the fuck, who used to still get $20 Carnegie sandwiches and bitch about money, he announced that they were going to close. And, like, Zoe pulled me aside and was like, oh, I'm so sorry. I would have never hired you. <laughs> like, did you just leave if you want. So I stayed for a couple <laughs> more months just to kind of be around that energy. I mean, it was pretty bewitching still, right? Like, they had nine K series or something obscene. Like, there was a floor where they had like 11 3348s which i think wow you know you remember those machines those like old sony uh, half inch digital recorders from the early 80s they were proto mm -hmm. digital recorders on open reel tape recording to half inch tape they could squeeze on 48 in 48 tracks i think it's seven and a half ips and that's what cla purportedly still mixes on like that's his shit really yeah yeah his that's shit. that's his shit but when they dropped man they were like i don't know two million bucks a piece or something insane and you know the hit factory had 11 of them you know, so it was like a different window into a different economy of scale of the music business, you know, but wow. Uh, yeah. And now like go on eBay, you, you, you'd be lucky to get $500 if you were trying to sell one, you know, if you want the CLA sound, it's not that it's pretty accessible now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Waves, <laughs> waves also makes it for you. So anyway, I worked there for a couple more months and it just got so grim that I, I, I bailed and went back to looking glass uh, and worked at Looking Glass and then by that time I had been hired into an assistant and I was like just assisting on sessions full time got to work a lot for uh, that producer Craig Street who is a straight up legend and one of my favorite people I got to learn a lot from him when I was really young Hector Castillo I got to work with all the Philip Glass ensemble people a lot like Michael Reisman I worked with a ton the guy who's playing all the crazy like synth keyboard bass and all the famous recordings and he, wow. Yeah, he's he's crazy. So talented and like a real grumpy guy. True <laughs> 70s grump. And then uh, I was working at Looking Glass for a while, and then the, the management got a call. Electric Lady was looking for an assistant for Russ Elevato. And Russ, to me, Russ was the reason I moved to New York. I was absolutely, and to this day, I'm still absolutely obsessed with Voodoo, that D'Angelo record, and more broadly, the whole Neo Soul. Neo Soul. Yeah, all yeah. that. M Mama's Gun, all those records, man. That's some of my favorite stuff as a fan. And so Christian knew this. The manager at Looking Glass knew this. And so when he heard that's who that they were looking for personnel for, he like immediately put me up for the gig. I went over there nice. and like, you know, shaved and like typed up a resume and got like all nice and shit. And uh, <laughs> I used like the nice paper and the whole thing. And so I showed up for the interview. Russ was like an hour late and like 
Lee was kind of glad handing me and showing me around the studio. But ultimately, when Russ told that I went upstairs, he like straight up, this is so funny, man. I think I, I spent the extra dollar at Kinko's or whatever and got the like nice heavy bond paper. And I dead ass swear to God, he he took my resume. He took one look at it and was like, OK, and then put it in his lap and started rolling a joint on it immediately. <laughs> and like, you know, I was young. I came up in the Pro Tools era and and like, well, really, like I started in like Reason and Acid, but like in Dawes, you know. And so Russ was like a tape guy. So I didn't really have the skill basis that he was looking for. But he was like, you seem cool. I'll teach you. And I have a suspicion because I used resume paper that was like nice enough for him to roll a joint on that I got the gig and I was like patient and showed up and was cool, you know? So anyway, I worked there for, for Russ doing like hundred hour weeks for like a year solid. No shit. Yeah. We worked with Al Green. We worked with D'Angelo. We worked with Kaziah Jones. We worked with Crystal Warren. I got to meet Doug Wimish and Will Calhoun. I got to meet Pino got to meet James Poyser, all the quest love, like just legends mm -hmm. on legends on legends, bro. Wow. Such a great place to, to work. Um, ultimately, the culture of the studio didn't end up being quite the right fit for me. So when Russ split, uh, I ended up going back to Looking Glass and by that time was kind of getting hired as a first assistant more, or not a first assistant, sorry, a first engineer sort of contemporaneously started looking towards finding my own spaces. Uh, I built a place in Tribeca that was ill-fated that I worked in for about a year. And then I uh, built a couple places in Brooklyn after Looking Glass finally closed. Me and one of the other engineers from up there built a place in Sunset Park. He moved out of there. He moved out of the city shortly thereafter, but I ended up staying in that spot and then staying in Sunset Park more broadly for, gosh, yeah, probably the last five or four or five years that I was in New York ended up in a great place on 42nd street in sunset park that was like a 3500 square foot illegal warehouse loft like oh sort of wow the quintessential like 1977 promise of what you could have once gotten in soho you know <laughs> it was fucked up like my downstairs neighbor was a halal butcher so like once a week there was an eight yard container full of blood on the sidewalk and like <sighs> oh my god uh, you know my direct downstairs neighbor w w was the cop well, my direct downstairs neighbor was, I'm pretty sure, uh, like a Eastern European furniture mafia front. But then next to them was a <laughs> huge 6,000 square foot warehouse where all the cops did all the like maintenance on their trucks and shit. And I had like a roof deck over it. It was bonkers, man. It was like it was like being in Mad Max or something like that kind of post-industrial craziness. Yeah. And it was great. I mean, I had like a 2,500 square foot tracking space. That's where I built this crazy console I work on. From those wow. years kind of working in the in the industry in the city, I got to meet a lot of really great people and got really dialed with a lot of new school graduates whom to this day continue to rule it and do very well in the music business across many sec sectors. Uh, so I started doing a lot of work with those kids and the, that just kind of turned, it spiraled out of control. <laughs> so I think now I've been full-time freelance for, god damn, 13 years or something like that. I was in New York. Ultimately, I did, like I said, I finished my stint in, in Brooklyn. Uh, after I got my 10. I got my 10-year You're a New Yorker card. They sh showed up in the mail, <laughs> and I got the fuck on a plane, man. I was like, see you guys later. Done. Uh, yeah. Nah, I mean, really, I started seeing the writing on the wall, man. I started seeing my neighborhood being written up as a cool place to go to parties. And, like, Chuck Close was coming out to art parties that DJs were throwing in warehouse districts. You remember that crazy, like, 10 million square foot industrial park right by the fucking pen in sunset park there's no. so on the bqe there's that costco on 39th and 3rd avenue okay and, and then there's the federal penitentiary black site like four blocks up or five blocks up on the on the waterfront between the bqe and the water that's okay. like where el chapo is being held and so that whole industrial zone between costco and the pen and then around the corner is owned by one fucking family so they had 10 million arable commercial square feet that had not been flipped and i was the second commercial tenant in one of those buildings the like second creative commercial tenant i should say um they had you know light manufacturing and all the shit that they had in there forever but uh, when that building really started changing, I was like, fuck, like either we got to buy something in this hood or we got to go right now. Uh, and so mm. 
basically with my rent and bills, I was looking at about a million dollar mortgage. Uh, it was expensive at that point to be in that space, even though it, it was reasonable for New York, right? So a million bucks in Sunset Park got you a 20. 